Turn to Exodus, the 14th chapter, please. I'd like to speak to you on the subject, the way of the Lord. Probably the most confusing thing in the scripture is to plot the way of the Lord. His ways are so odd and so strange, the minute you think you got it figured out, he does something totally different. As, as a way of an introduction to the message which is on the children of Israel leaving Egypt, God spoke to Abraham and gave him good news and bad news. God said, Abraham, at the time his name was just Abram, Abraham, I'm taking you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's gonna be the promised land. That was the good news. The bad news, is what he gives Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis when he says, your descendants are going to live in a strange land for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out with a mighty deliverance. Why God had to tell that to Abraham 400 years before it even happened, I don't know, except that Abraham would pass it down to the next generation and next generation so they would know how to plan for the 400 years. How do you plan for 400 years? I don't know. But God's ways are so strange. God is in the business of delivering people. He said that the children of Israel would be in bondage for 400 years in Egypt land, and then he would bring them out with a mighty deliverance. All through the Bible, it doesn't even matter what book you're looking at in the Bible, but all through the Bible, God is in the process of delivering people. Lot is in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God is going to destroy the place, and God plans to deliver Lot from that place. Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son who is going downhill fast. He's in a pig's pen, and he needs deliverance, and he turns back and comes back home, and his father greets him with open arms, and he's delivered. Samson is addicted to Philistine women, and he's in big trouble. His eyes were plucked out, and he's grinding wheat in a, in a dungeon somewhere, and, and he needs deliverance. And every way you look in the scripture, God is in the process of delivering people from the things that bind them. So what would the children of Israel leaving Egypt after 400 years have to do with us? I mean, we've never been slaves. Uh, if, if you've ever been in an abusive relationship, That's bondage. If you have ever been in debt, and I want you to you can't get out, that's bondage. I heard that Kanye West, who's married to Kim Kardashian, is in a hole for $53 million and needs a loan. He's checking around to find out if he can get somebody to lend him a billion dollars. You know, I, I, the numbers are staggering in my head. I, I cannot think of a time I ever was that broke. <laughs> I've been broke, but never to the tune of $53 million. <laughs> and here's this man that sizzles on the screen, and he's in bondage. Sometimes people can look so good on the outside, and emotionally, they're in bondage. She's a foxy lady, but inside she's a wicked witch. <laughs> he looks like Robert Redford, but he feels like the hunchback of Notre Dame. He, uh, it, it doesn't matter how you look, on. sometimes people look so fine on the outside, but inside they're just broken up because they're in bondage. And it's not just drugs and booze, because we know that that's uh, addictions. But some people can, are in bondage by their past memories. They just can't release a memory that holds on to them. 
or they're in bondage to their anger. They, they don't want to be angry, but something happens and it just flares up and, and they, there they go again, angry, and then they try to control. They can't because they can't, because they're in bondage. Anybody who's ever been bitter knows what bondage is. Nobody wants to be bitter. But sometimes we can get so stuck in circumstances that we just can't climb out of that bitterness. That's God's in the business of delivering people who are in bondage, whatever they... You could be driving a new car, can't make the payments. That's bondage. Depression. Fear. Worry. And so when you read the scripture, you see God delivering people. He's in the process of delivering people. But the truth is he's still delivering people because people still need to be delivered. They're still going through some stuff. And God steps into our world in the area where we are tied, limited, broken, beaten, and delivers us. So when we get to the story of the children of Israel and they finally... They finally experience the tenth plague, and Pharaoh says they can go. So they leave. Prince of Egypt displays it this way. And when they're leaving Egypt, they, they're almost like sluggish because they can't believe the freedom that they have. But then it picks up the pace. Look at this. For the first time in all those years, they finally sense what it feels like to be free. And we've never been in that type of bondage, so it might be a little difficult for us to put ourselves in their sandals and feel the freedom. I, 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 freedom, freedom, freedom is a wonderful thing. People will give their lives up in order to have freedom. When I, when I got my honorable discharge from the army, I, it was in the month of May, and, and everything was wonderful when I, when I left the army because I felt free for the first time I could be a civilian again, and no more KP duty, and no more guard duty, and no more waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning and standing on line out in the cold. It, it, free. What does freedom mean to you? These people were leaving Egypt, and for the first time it dawned on them that they really were going to a promised land and they could be singing what Martin Luther King said, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. We're going to the land of milk and honey, and I could just see them giving each other high fives as they're moving down. God delivered. And then the scripture says, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. 
So there was a shortcut, and the shortcut was simply from A to B, it was a straight line, and they would be in the promised land, and God chose not to send them that way because that way was going to lead them into some stress and some conflict, and they were not prepared for war, so God decided he would lead them another way. And the scripture tells us that he led them by a cloud, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before the Red Sea. That's the wrong way. If you want to know something about the ways of God, God sometimes takes us the wrong way to get us where he wants us to go. And so the children of Israel now are directed into a hot, burning, dusty desert that's leading them to a trap. That's the wrong way. I, I think to myself as I'm reading a story that if there were faith teachers in that day, they probably would have went to the people and said, you know, if you really had faith, you'd be going the other way. If you, if you really had, and, and the people do that, they do that with God's word today. They, they go around sharing their brilliance. They, they, they know what God's will is and God, God's way is. If you really knew God's way, you, you wouldn't have a headache. If you knew God's way, you wouldn't have a sore throat. If you knew God's way, you wouldn't have a flat tire. If you really knew and went God's way and had, had faith, you wouldn't, your washing machine wouldn't leak. It, it's so, so flippant the way they toss God's way and make us feel bad that we're going in a way that God has chosen but it doesn't look good and almost every once in a while we need to stop and we need to say show me your ways that I may walk with you I just don't understand your ways I want to put my trust in you. And God will take you and me down a path that seems absolutely wrong. But God's ways are strange. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That was God's way. We think that God's way is like Elvis Presley saying, he's going to lead us into a peaceful valley. There will be peace in the valley. And we get to the valley, we find there are pieces. Because God's ways are strange. I went to Bible school, I studied, I really was, I mean, I was really excited about Bible school. I, I studied, I studied way past the time it was considered lights out. When it was lights out at Bible study, I think it was 10 o'clock, I still had the light on, but I would put a towel around the door cracks so that the monitors wouldn't be able to see that there was light coming out because I wanted to study, I just, and when I graduated, I figured, well, okay, now, now I, I graduated, now I, now I can be a minister, and I found that God opened up the door for me to be a custodian. Show me your way. Mop and glow with Joe. I <laughs> know. Show me your way. God's ways are strange. And God is leading the children of Israel in a wrong way. And God told. And Moses, that this was a setup. He was going to trap Pharaoh. And he was going to make Pharaoh think that the children of Israel didn't know where they were going and they were trapped by the Red Sea. And, and when Pharaoh drew near, and that's exactly what Pharaoh did, he, he realized that his scouts came and told him that the children of Israel were wandering. They didn't know where they were going. He said, well, I'm going to take them and bring them back. And so when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. What they saw was... 
Pharaoh coming after them and they believed he would kill them and leave them in the wilderness or take them back as slaves and they weren't prepared for that. They didn't understand God's psychology. He was using reverse psychology on, on Pharaoh. He was going to make Pharaoh think that they were really trapped, but actually God was trapping them. But the children of Israel didn't know that, and so they cried out. They didn't realize God was using them as bait. I wonder if God could use us as bait to get somebody to do what he wants done, and he's using us. I think so. Show me your ways. God's got his ways. And the children of Israel saw us and they were afraid. And when a person is afraid, what happens is, in, faith, in fact, if you, if you want to understand faith, faith is like faith. Fear is like faith. Faith, when it's driven by fear, believes that nothing is going to work out right. They have faith that it's going to fail. That's fear. Fear makes us victims, not victors. We live every day tossing around in our mind the worst case scenario that we have. This is faith and fear. We just believe that everything is going to fall apart, nothing is going to work out right. And, and the children of Israel saw this, and their knees are knocking, and their hands are sweaty, and their mouth is dry. And they don't know what to do because they're totally they're in panic. They're in a state of panic. Now, there are some fears that are good. There are good fears. It's, it's a good idea to be afraid to make bad decisions. It's a good idea when you go to the zoo that you don't put your hand in the cage where the poison snakes are. That's a good kind of fear. Fear keeps us from putting our finger in the flame again. It keeps us from putting our finger in an electrical socket. It, it helps us to avoid danger. There's, so there's a good fear. There's, there's good be fears and there's bad fear. Bad fear paralyzes us. Good fear will, will teach us, you know, this kind of a person is toxic. I want to stay away from this person. A, a, a good kind of fear will, I, I want to stay away from building a bad relationship because I don't need this in my life. The children of Israel were afraid, and they were afraid because they thought they were going to die, and Pharaoh was going to kill them and lead them out in, in the wilderness. And so they cried out to the Lord, but don't be fooled by their crying out to the Lord because they turned right around and they cried against Moses. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Do you pick up the sarcasm? When you're really angry, you can be really sarcastic. There's something about anger that can sharpen your tongue, make it razor sharp. Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not what we, the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. What they, what they were saying is what people sometimes think in their minds today, you know, it would have been better for me to serve the devil than to follow the cloud. Because when I was serving the devil, I didn't have as much problems as I have now that I'm following the cloud. If somebody some, somehow convinced us that if we follow the cloud, our troubles are over. Who, who told you that? But the children of Israel are all upset, they're all, and they're angry at Moses, and of course he's the leader, they're blaming, they can't beat up on God, he's too far away, so they beat up on the person that's next door. And then Moses said to the people, and if I were writing the scripture, it would be something like this, and Moses said to the people, you can keep all the stuff that you're doing because I'm out of here, I'm going back to my father-in-law to take care of the sheep, I don't need sheep like you, I'm gone. Moses was quick thinking, and Moses could have fought fire with fire, and they do sarcasm at him, and he could sharpen his tongue and fling it right back at them, but he doesn't do that. This is what he says. He says, do not be afraid. He looked past their arrogance and their fear and their panic, and he saw the real need. He said, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more forever. Get your eyes. Get your eyes off the chariot wheels. 
and get your eyes off of the hoof beats and get your eyes off of the army that's coming after you and get your eyes off of the cloud of dust and get your eyes on the salvation. You know, it's, it's hard to see the salvation of the Lord when you're looking at chariot wheels. It's, it's hard to see the salvation of the Lord when you're looking down at the dirt and you say, this is my grave. They're going to bury me here. It's hard to see the salvation of the Lord when the horses are coming and galloping after you and you don't have time. They're galloping and all you can do is walk. In fact, you can't even walk anywhere because before you is the Red Sea. On either side of you is a mountainous region and behind you is Pharaoh coming up. Where are you going to go? It's hard to see the salvation of God when everything around you is falling to pieces. That what, what we, what we, here's what we say, gloom, despair, and agony on me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. That's what we, we see. We see the thing that's in front of our eyes. We're so close to the present set of circumstances that we can't see that Moses is saying, you shall, shall, future tense. I'm in the present tense, and I can't, I can't embrace the future because I'm too close to the problem that I'm facing. I, I can't see it. And so we sing, show me your way. I, I, I got to make the sermon practical because if it's not practical, we, all we have is a dusty sermon from the past. And I, I, when, when I was born, I was born and raised in poverty, not because we planned it that way. It just, it just happened. My dad died and we were poor and mom went on to welfare. But I'm not on the welfare anymore, and it's been long since I've had to worry about how to raise the rent. It's, it's been a long time. I got money in my pocket. I got gas in, in the tank. I got a fo uh, uh, food in the refrigerator, and I got a, a roof over my head. I, I'm way past that. But every once in a while, some politician or some financial wizard gets out there and says, the America is heading for doom and gloom and there's no way. And if you think the recession is bad, wait till the depression. And then I think inside, I say, uh-oh. It's a sense of insecurity. You know, I, I grew up in poverty and it creates a sense of insecurity. And then even though you get away from it, somebody could just... send a little tap your way and your spirit says uh oh the economy takes a downward turn uh oh suddenly there's a recession uh oh the wall street jitters uh oh so even though God has delivered us and we are far removed from what it was that it used to be, it's easy, it's, listen to me, it's easy for us to be lured back into the fear that we had. Even though when I was a kid and was poor, I didn't know it until later on. And then when I figured it out, I said, oh, I don't want to go back there. It's, it's hard to see the promise of God when you're looking at the problem. All our time and our attention and our energy is focused in on the problem and we cannot, it's so blurry to see. I can't see the promise because the problem is in the way. My focus of my attention is the problem and not the promise. But I tell you, it's a blessed person. It's a blessed person who can look at the problem and remember the promise. David wrote this, says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and then he writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. I say, Wow, that is, if you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it should be gloom and doom, but, but somehow your spirit was picked up, and you're saying, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I, I, I like that. He can see the problem, and he can see the promise. But all too often, when we're in the wilderness, 
And the Lord sends somebody to say, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We're so focused in on the wilderness, we can't see the tree. Because we're looking at the problem. And the promise seems so far out of reach. I can't embrace it. Because it's the problem that keeps me up. But for every problem that we face, it doesn't matter what the problem is. It doesn't matter what your problem is. It doesn't matter what my problem is. Whatever problem we face, God has a promise connected to it. So you are facing a mountain and God's promise is this mountain shall be removed. That's the promise. As you, and you're going through something, there's always something that we're, that we're going through. It seems like the way we are is so crooked and, and the promise is the crooked shall be made straight. And the place seems to be so rough, it's rough going, and the promises and the rough places shall become smooth. God's got a promise for every problem that we have ever had or ever will have. He's got a promise to come rushing to our aid. Lord, open my eyes. I need to see you, Lord. Because sometimes the only thing I can see, the only thing I can see, I see the pink slip. I don't see the better job. I see the economy nosediving. I, I don't see that the economy nosediving has wakened up something inside of me that will prepare myself so I don't have to go through that again. I don't see that. I only see the problem. I see the bills mounting and I see the income shrinking. I see the stock market fumbling. I see all of the problems, but, but I just have a hard time. So I don't blame the children of Israel when, when they had a hard time seeing the salvation of the Lord because I'd have been right there with them. I'd have, said, I'd have said, where, where, where? What are you talking about? In fact, I wanted to drop by today, and the only reason why I, I'm actually preaching on this passage is I wanted to deal with those of us who have to go through problems and it's difficult for us to grab hold of the promise while we're going through the problem. That we know that God is going to show us his salvation but I just can't see it. And I know God has said, has said so many times do not be afraid but I am afraid and it's too late because I'm already there. That's the person I wanted to share with today. Open my eyes. the disciples the disciples are told to get in the boat go to the other side to get in the boat go to the other side to get in the middle of the lake and the middle of the storm breaks out and and and, and jesus comes walking on the waters and they think it's a ghost but it was the promise we can be confused because we don't know god's ways god's ways are strange what do you think, the three Hebrew boys walked into the fiery furnace with their chest out and said, yeah, bring it on. No, they, they saw the fiery furnace and they saw they were gonna be, they're going to be burned like crispy critters in just a few minutes. They didn't see, they, but they got to the place where they could see the fourth man. God opened up their eyes. Sometimes it seems like it comes too late, but it, but it will come. You know why we're, we're so focused on weeping may endure for the night? That's what we see. That's what we feel. That's where we hurt. And we don't go to where the promises joy comes in the morning. God has a promise for every problem. Lord, open up my eyes to see. It's not easy. It's not easy. I was, I was sharing with my Tuesday night class something that comes to mind. When Joey was a little kid, I don't know, maybe six years old, five or six years old, we were planning to go to Mojave, the houseboats. And uh, he, he came and asked Nancy Ann, how long will it be before we could 
get on the boat? And she said, a month. And he said, what's a month? And she said, 30 days. He said, what's 30 days? So she got a calendar and she showed him, you see, this is where we are right now and you count 30 days, this is where we're going. Uh, he didn't understand that. So Nancy went out and bought a fishing rod. She brought it home and put it next to his bed. And she told Joey, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to see this fishing rod. It will remind you that we're going to Lake Mojave. He had an object now that he could see. He didn't understand days, hours, weeks, months. He didn't understand. He understood fishing. He could see that. And God wants to show us something that we could see to help us through those do-nothing days when we're surrounded by the fear and the problem. And, and it's okay. It is okay when we struggle with this thing because we are all going to struggle with the fact that God has a promise for the problem because we get hit over the head with the problem so often we just fail to see the promise. It's there. We can't see it. It's there. We're distracted. God told Paul, he appeared to Paul, and he said, Paul, you are going to stand before me in Rome and give witness, your testimony, to Caesar. So now he's armed with the promise. Okay, now I know. I know I'm going to Rome. He gets on a ship, going to Rome. The ship runs into a storm. They throw overboard everything that they got, including the tackle, everything, thrown overboard. And then Luke writes, he said, all hope that we should be saved was gone. God gave him the promise. But by circumstances, the storm, the wild hurricane, the promise got lost in the storm. So God had to send an angel to the boat that was going to sink to tell Paul, oh, I meant what I said the other time. When I talked with you, I told you, you're going, you are going to stand before Caesar and give your testimony. The promise hasn't been taken away because the ship is sinking or because the ship is going down or because you're wet or because you're cold or because things, be, fill in the blank. The promise is not going to change because you're hurting. The promise is not going to change because you're distracted. The promise is not going to change because things are happening in your life. The promise the word of God is true. Let every man be a liar, but let God's word be true. If he said it, shall he not also do it? He's God. Show me your way. Open up my eyes, I get to see. I want to see your promise. It's his promise that I need to see. You have probably heard me say over the years many times that no weapon formed against you will prosper. It's a statement found in scripture and it's a common promise that we find in God's word. But when you get to the story of the children of Israel as they are passing through the Red Sea and they're afraid, this is where this scripture verse really comes alive. But it took a couple of thousand years to show this. Somebody dove into the deep waters of the Red Sea and they took pictures of the chariot wheels that were left behind by Pharaoh, who after the children of Israel passed the Red Sea, Pharaoh decided he would go into the Red Sea after them. And then God caused the waters to fall, and the chariot wheels to get stuck. The Bible says he had 600 chariots. They were the best chariots he had. He had good chariots. They were good weapons. 
but no weapon formed against you will prosper. Doesn't matter how good the weapon is, it won't prosper. That's the promise of God. They, they fashioned a cross to destroy Jesus. But the cross couldn't take him out. And then they put him in a tomb. And the tomb couldn't hold him. Because no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This altar is open and this is a wonderful day to accept Jesus and come to him with the hurt and with the pain and with whatever it is that we're going to. Jesus, Jesus, show me your promise. Open up my eyes to see. I need you.